Euromax highlights in today's show. Capital Cuts. Berlin fashion designer Michael Michalski presents his new collection. Radical Rooms. 50 years of design hotels in Europe. Romantic Road. A trip along Germany's most popular tourist route. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Hello and a warm to sweltering welcome to our Highlights edition. And seeing as the days are so unbelievably hot in our neck of the woods, we're going to start off by taking you to one of the coolest night spots on the planet. And if you put on your dancing shoes, you can also work up a sweat there as Sankey's in Manchester, England, has been recently voted best dance club in the world by 80,000 clubbers. <laughs> Sankey's has just been named the world's best club. So what exactly is it that sets this Manchester venue apart from the competition? I love Sankey's because it's a fantastic atmosphere. Everyone's really friendly. Manchester's got all the best music. I like Sankey's because it's sexy. It's such an amazing place. I wish I lived in Sankey's. More than a thousand clubbers can fit into the venue, making it pretty small for a club with such a big reputation. Sankey's has had to close down twice since it first opened in 1994. It opened in its current incarnation four years ago. One of the club's regular DJs is Greg Vickers. He's a familiar face in the big international clubs. He moved to Manchester 10 years ago, drawn mainly by the Sankey's legend. It's raw. It's got low ceilings in the place, you know, you can touch the ceiling, it's, it's, uh, it, that creates an atmosphere, you know, it's hot, it's steamy, it's kind of naughty, you know, it's like it shouldn't really be here, it's, um, it, it, I don't know, it's addictive. Sankey's is tucked away in a former factory building in Ancoats, East Manchester. The city has some 500,000 residents and huge musical credentials. In the 1980s and 90s, it spawned the landmark Factory Records, as well as some seminal bands from Joy Division to New Order, The Smiths, and of course, Brit Popper's Oasis. Manchester was long considered England's music capital, and the thriving club scene that gave rise to Sankey's is a byproduct of that. A lot of DJs who launched their careers in these hallowed walls went on to become superstars. DJ Mistress Defunk is currently one of the most sought after DJs in England. The Sankey's crowd are very musically educated, so they understand underground music, and the people that come here, it's their whole life. It's not full of posers or people that come here because it's fashionable it's full of people that understand music once a year dj mag publishes its list of the 100 best clubs in the world this year's findings were based on a survey of 80,000 readers nine european clubs made the top 10 with sankeys at the very top it's unusual in the sense that it's one of these clubs that it has the best kind of people playing, but also a lot of the more commercial people playing, and it doesn't really sort of differentiate too much between the two. It's sort of saying there's room for everyone, it's very inclusive, which some of the cooler clubs might not be so open to. Not too cool, that's always a winning formula. No one understands that better than David Vincent, Sankey's owner and a former promoter for various world famous clubs. Sankey's is the crowning glory to an illustrious career. Sankey's is an amalgamation of all the best club experiences I've had around the world, namely in them cities, Peru, Sao Paulo, Ibiza, London, New York, you know. Sankey's outposts are due to open soon in New York and London. One day, there will be seven scattered across the globe. And for many, that's a lucky number. 
while German fashion designer Michael Michalski spent many a night working as a doorman at various London clubs whilst studying at the London College of Fashion. Now, this soon sparked an interest for him in the connection between music and fashion. Well, he then employed his talents to spike up brands like Levi's and Adidas, but soon went on to make his own collections, sometimes working up some real suds with his sponsors. <laughs> Michael Michalski's latest creations for Ariel. He's a perfectionist and checks every last detail. He wants these summer outfits to be wearable and easy to care for. Michalski even steps in front of the camera himself to advertise his wares. I think it makes much more sense for a detergent manufacturer like Ariel to work together with a designer, rather than some actress or film star or something like that. After all, with my team, I create things every day that have to be taken care of somewhere. That's really part of our thought process, and it gives the whole thing credibility. If the designer doesn't know how to wash something, who should know? The collection comprises seven items of clothing for the modern woman's everyday life. For example, a pantsuit for the office, Bermudas for shopping, a jersey dress for going out. For his own label, Michalski also designs elegant clothes for real people in the real world. He himself prefers wearing tennis shoes and jeans. There's a false kind of elitism in fashion. People try to make things for a tiny group of consumers. That's not how I see myself. I see myself as a designer of practical clothing. In the 1990s, Michalski made a name for himself as head designer for Adidas. He helped turn the sport article manufacturer with a frumpy image into a cool lifestyle brand. He found inspiration on the city streets. Streetwear fashion with the three stripes even found its way into the music scene. Pop stars like Elton John, Madonna, and Robbie Williams wear Adidas. Michel Michalski also helped the Munich company MCM make a fashion comeback. The designer gave the dusty luxury label a new look by combining some of the brand's classic elements from the 1980s with new trends. Retro elements are always important for me. They're like a reference to the past. Just like a lot of good new music today is created with samples from the past. I mean, today every pop star does that. He uses samples to create something new. And I think we have to do that in fashion, especially when you want to underscore that a brand has a past. Then he created his own label, Michalski, and presented his first collection in 2007 with a show in Berlin. He set out to conquer the world of fashion. Fellow designers like Wolfgang Jörg were delighted. Critics celebrated him as the new prodigy of the German fashion world. I don't really pay much attention to the press. Of course, I'm very happy about the praise, but those are the opinions of a few individuals. What is really important for me, and what makes this one of the best days in my life, is that I have made a dream come true, a dream I've cherished since I was 14. The Michalski label has indeed been a great success. The designer has opened two shops in Berlin. His vision is to turn his fashion label into a lifestyle empire. When you sit down and say, I'm proud of this and that, then you get lazy. You've finished with your life a bit. And I have the feeling that my brand and I are still at the beginning. Well, perhaps not quite the beginning. Michalski's fashion is already sold all over the world. Well, time now to celebrate half a century of design hotels in Europe. The Radisson Blue Royal Hotel in Copenhagen, completely designed by Arne Jakobsen, opened its doors 50 years ago. Well, at the time, it was an absolute revolution in the concept of hotels. So we thought we'd return to it to see if it has stood the test of time and also take a look at some more recent examples in a sector that is absolutely booming. 
The Radisson Blue Royal Hotel is a sleek high-rise in the center of Copenhagen. The interior is full of modernist design classics. The five-star hotel opened half a century ago. All 260 rooms looked like this back then. Now only suite 606 retains the original 60s furnishings such as the egg chair. They and the building were all designed by the great Arne Jakobsen and were commissioned by Scandinavian Airlines. The hotel represented the height of modernism back then. Roy Al Kappenberger is the son of the first director. In fact, his first name reflects the hotels. We all are very proud that uh, the entire hotel, uh, with the interior, with the furniture, was designed by, by uh, one person only, and uh, the person was Arne Jakobsen. He was a uh, genius at his time as, in, as an architect. So that makes it very unique. I cannot imagine any other hotel uh, that has been designed from A to Z, really, with all the details from one person. Lux 11 is a design hotel in downtown Berlin. The mix of old and new is typical of stylish New Berlin. The hotel appeals to trendy globetrotters in their 30s who want a cool looking room and good food and want to meet people. The hotel opened in 2005, one of the first design hotels in Berlin. Occupancy rates are high for the 72 rooms and so the owners are thinking of opening another hotel. Hotels that belong to big chains are all the same. You know what to expect. When you wake up, you can't tell what city you're in. Here, we worked hard to create lots of details and give the hotel a distinct identity so that you know where you are. Guests remember that. And that's what makes it special. Patrick Rosenthal is, by profession, a hotel critic. He established the World Hotel Awards, given to the best contenders in various categories. He's been observing closely the boom in design hotels in recent years. If you just think about the word design, it has to do with giving form or shape. People have become sick and tired of hotels that just about fulfill the criteria to qualify for their four or five stars. But they're nothing special in terms of service, say, or beautiful design. Rosenthal has been checking out the new design hotel rumors in Frankfurt. The very first impression is extremely important. We're in the lobby of Rumors Hotel. And what you notice first are the fantastic lamps designed by Rashid. And here you see how design and function mesh perfectly. The swan chairs by Roberto Cavalli. He designed this lamp too. Good design and beautiful objects. And the staff look like models. It all just works. Rumors opened just one year ago, so it represents the latest in boutique hotel design, modern yet cozy. Rumors style was created by different interior designers. The 117 rooms and suites are chiefly booked by business people. At the Royal Radisson Blue Hotel in Copenhagen, some may feel as if they're in a design museum, but it's more than just classics that make the experience. It's the aesthetics of the place as a whole that give guests something to remember. And that's what they want, just as they did half a century ago. Well, for many, many centuries, the marble from the northwestern Italian city of Carrara has had the reputation of being the finest and purest in the world. Michelangelo himself loved it, but for many sculptors today, the material is simply too expensive. Well, business in Carrara has slowed down somewhat as a result, but many artists still make a pilgrimage every two years for the International Sculpture Festival there to show what they can do with this marvelous stone, and our reporter was there. Marble used to be cut into blocks here. Now it's a venue for contemporary art. New takes on an exquisite material prized by artists for millennia. A video installation shows young artists studying the works of Michelangelo, paradigms of harmony and beauty. Of course, no modern artist seeks to replicate his achievements. 
the most exquisite marble has been mined here in Carrara for more than 2,000 years. A work of art in this old church is dedicated to the marble miners of long ago. Giorgio Andreotta Carlo brought the unhewn block down the mountain. I climb the mountain to meet, to face the material. It's not easy to work with. It's extremely hard. It resists you. That's what creates the honest relationship, a relationship of equals between you and nature. Unhewn rocks are sculpted at this workshop, which belongs to the company that owns the mines. Franco Barattini is the boss of the mines, the same ones Michelangelo used. Many artists have their works made here, and not all have to do the preparatory work themselves. You see how transparent it is? That's why Michelangelo came here to Carrara to select his marble. It's important to choose the right block at the quarry. You need a perfect block to create a sculpture, to create a David or a Pietà. It has to be without flaws. If it isn't perfect, it can fracture as you're working. And you might have spent 12, 15 or 20 months working in vain. Barattini selects the blocks to be sculpted in the workshop himself. His craftsmen have worked for some of the artists represented at the Biennale. This derelict shed is where British sculptor Anthony Gormley has chosen to display his marble twins. They were sculpted by a computer-driven machine. This work is materialist. It's about the crystalline structure of marble and not the idealized human form. It has absolutely nothing to do with the relationship of bone to muscle to skin, which used to be the anatomical basis of the Renaissance project of putting the body to work in terms of like basic narratives. There is no narrative here. Here are two identical reproduced pieces that in some curious way represent a kind of shrinking. I mean, I'm not entirely sure what the emotion is of this, of this uh, position. It's, 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 it's certainly not one of heroism. It's a one of doubt. It's principally a one of doubt. Works by 35 contemporary artists are on show at the Biennale. Not all work with marble. For some, it's too expensive or too difficult to work with or to transport. British conceptual artist Gillian Waring took photos of people posing on a marble pedestal. Particularly since looking around the show and having talked to Fabio and doing visits out here, that um, I've become more fascinated about the artisans that do actually work here and produce sculpture and use marble. That's not part of where this work is coming from, but maybe in the future I'm actually interested in maybe doing something in marble because of being here. Whether artists embrace, question or reject tradition, Carrara continues to be a landmark for all who love exquisite marble. And finally, we come back to Germany for an exquisite holiday tour along the Romantic Road. Now, this is Germany's first ever designated tourist route that winds its way 385 kilometers from the River Main to the Alps. Our reporter, anna Katrin Gottschling, got to use a variety of modes of transport as she journeyed from the historic city of Würzburg to Füssen, near the Austrian border. Germany's oldest tourist route, the Romantic Road, was opened in 1950, and it winds its way 385 kilometers through the south of the country, from Würzburg to Füssen. The initial idea was to call this route a Romantic Road for couples in love, but then the founding fathers decided that that was too long, plus this title wouldn't have fit on these brown signs anyway. The route runs through some of Germany's most beautiful countryside and numerous quaint old towns. In Würzburg, you can pick up a bike and follow the romantic road cycle path or take an organized tour. The palace, the residence, 
was the home of the powerful Prince Bishops of Würzburg until the start of the 19th century. Its splendid 18th century Baroque architecture helped it make it onto the UNESCO World Cultural Heritage List. The residence itself has a lot to do with the idea behind the Romantic Road. It has to do with the great romantic concept of synesthesia, with overloading all the senses at the same time. Anna Katrin has covered the first 40 kilometers of the Romantic Road. Her next stop is a well-known German wine estate in the Tauber Valley. People have grown wine here for over a thousand years, and that's of course why the landscape is as it is. So wine has been drawing bon vivants to Taubatal for centuries. Today grapes are picked the same way as they were 60 years ago, by hand. At harvest time and when the first wines are ready, the local vintners turn their homes into makeshift inns. Many young women from the area dream of one day becoming the wine queen, or like here in Rottingen, the wine princess. But to get to wear the crown, they have to know their stuff, like explaining bottle shapes. Traditional box bottle shape dates back to a time when people would keep the wine in goat's bladders. That explains its shape. Rotenburg ob der Taube is the most famous town on the route. It's car free, but you can take a rickshaw taxi. It boasts just 12,000 residents, but as many as two and a half million visitors a year. Rotenburg was on a major north-south trade route, and that route is now known as the Romantic Road. So the tourists traveling that route automatically end up here in our town. One hundred and forty kilometers from the start at Würzburg is Feuchtwangen. This is a good place to switch means of transport once again. This is where the romantic railroad begins. You can go about 50 kilometers of the romantic road by train, and if you're lucky like I am today, you can even do it on one of the old trains like this one. To mark the 60th anniversary of the Romantic Road, every Sunday a vintage train runs between Feuchtwangen and Nördlingen. This is the There's such a nice nostalgic feel. Reminds me of when I was a little girl in England where we went by train then. And the sounds and everything is really exciting. The river Wörnitz runs right alongside the railway line and accompanies the Romantic Road for around 130 kilometers. The Wernitz is ideal for a paddle tour, as it's not too deep and it's not too wide. Dinkelsbühl is one of the prettiest towns on the route. The old town has hardly changed since the 15th century. The head tourism office of the Romantic Road is here. Jürgen Wünschensmeier is in charge, and of course he knows the area like no other. The route, he says, was clear from the start. They reached agreement very swiftly in defining it. The Romantic Road has been very successful, and we're always getting requests from towns and villages to be added to it. They all write and tell us how pretty it is where they are, and romantic. Couldn't you have the road pass by here too? But so far we haven't done anything like that. We've stayed true to the original. The southern part of the route is famous for its castles and palaces, like the world-famous Neuschwanstein Castle built by the eccentric Bavarian king Ludwig II. It attracts a million visitors a year. It's the most famous castle in the world. It has been reconstructed in many other places, and all the visitors come here first. It's important. The castle is romantic looking and reminds you of the olden times. Every single room was designed by the monarch, although only 15 of 200 were actually completed. King Ludwig was a man of vision. He created his own world, a mystical world, a mysterious world. Ludwig was also enigmatic himself. King Ludwig II only actually lived in his castle for a few months, 
After his death, it was open to the paying public to tackle the massive debts the king had amassed building it. The last stage takes us to the very southern tip of Germany, to Füssen in the Allgäu region, which is only five kilometers from the Austrian border. Füssen is the highest town in Bavaria, and this is where the romantic road comes to an end. And don't forget that if you'd like to see them again, you can find our series reports on our website. Just type in dw-world.de slash English slash Euromax and happy viewing. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of our highlights. So I hope you enjoyed them. And until we meet again, alles Gute aus Berlin. And thanks for watching. Bye-bye.